Hello, I'm Peter Bovey and I'd like to talk to you about hernias. Firstly, I'll talk about hernias in general and then specific types of hernias. Firstly, what is a hernia? Well, the underlying defect in a hernia is a hole in the, or a weakness in the abdominal wall which allows some of the intra-abdominal contents to prolapse out and protrude. Most hernias have a hernial sac, which is an extension of the lining of the abdominal cavity, which is we call the peritoneum. However, there are some hernias that don't have a hernial sac. In that case, what's protruding is either extra peritoneal fat or an extra peritoneal organ. Some of these have specific names. In the groin, for example, if extra peritoneal fat is the hernia, we call it a cord lipoma. Small umbilical hernias often just contain extra peritoneal fat or part of a falciform ligament. Symptoms people get from hernias. Generally, there is a lump. Usually it's visible or a swelling. In small hernias, these lumps may only appear with the patient standing or when they're coughing or lifting. The lump may disappear when the patient lies down or may disappear overnight. The lump is often associated with some low-grade discomfort or pain, particularly early on in the life of the hernia. This discomfort is exacerbated by coughing, sneezing and heavy lifting and is usually relieved by lying down or reducing the hernia. Hernias may be asymptomatic and indeed are often completely unnoticed by the patient. What are the risk factors for hernias? Well, basically anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure, namely obesity, chronic cough, chronic constipation, prostatism, or doing heavy lifting. Other risk factors for hernias are a strong family history of hernias. There are individuals who, ha who are born with a congenital abnormality of their collagen or elastin. They're often referred to as having type A collagen. These patients tend to get multiple hernias and often have recurrent hernias. Other risk factors for hernias are anything that will weaken the abdominal wall. In particular, pregnancy. Women will often develop small hernias in their umbilicus or groin during pregnancy. A surgically created hole in the abdominal wall, such as a colostomy, ileostomy or ileal conduit, or an incision since uh, an healed incision is never as strong as the uh, original abdominal wall. What investigations do we normally do for hernias? Well, normally none. A hernia is usually diagnosed on the basis of history and examination. A careful examination needs to be done. Not all the hernias are apparent at the time of examination by a surgeon. I've certainly seen patients who gave an excellent description of a hernia and when I examined them, no hernia was found. The first time this happened, it was a young man who complained of a large inguinal hernia and when I examined him, his groin was normal. I was a junior trainee at the time and I advised him to come back when the hernia was next out. He represented the next day and his hernia was very obvious and almost the size of my fist. I'm happy to operate on people with a convincing story when the examination findings are normal. I think in terms of imaging, CT and MRI are the most useful modality. Ultrasound is often ordered by GPs. Sadly, I find the diagnosis of hernia by ultrasound in the groin, at least in my city, to be notoriously unreliable. Obvious hernias don't need an ultrasound, and uh, hernias that aren't obvious are usually misdiagnosed by ultrasound and I'm afraid that I've found the accuracy and specificity of this examination to be less than 50% and I hardly ever order one myself. Many patients I see are referred with an ultrasound diagnosed hernia 
But if I can't feel a hernia, I don't offer them an operation. Ultrasound may be of use elsewhere, particularly in the umbilicus, where I think it's more reliable. What types of hernia do we see? The commonest referral I'll see with a hernia is an inguinal hernia, that's a hernia in the groin. The majority of these, I think something like 90% of them, are male. There are two different types of inguinal hernia, we call them direct and indirect. They look the same, we repair them in exactly the same way and it's not of any clinical importance which type of hernia it is. The other common groin hernia is ephemeral hernia. These are more common in women and they're often misdiagnosed. The commonest hernia probably in the world is an umbilical or paraumbilical hernia. These are hernias that occur at the navel. A true umbilical hernia is symmetrical, that is namely in the centre of the umbilicus. A paraumbilical hernia is next to the umbilicus, in other words it's asymmetrical. I believe probably as many as 1 in 10 adults will have an umbilical hernia. It's often a common hernia also in infancy, along with the inguinal hernia. The other hernias that we see commonly are incisional hernias. These are hernias that develop at the site of an abdominal incision. There are also uh, less common hernias. Parastomal hernias are quite commonly associated with stomas. And there are some rare hernias. These are spigillian hernias, which are in the anterior abdominal wall. Lumbar hernias, which are in the loin. Interparietal hernias, which could best be described as a partial hernia, where the most uh, anterior layer of the abdominal wall is still intact. The obturator hernia, which is a rare hernia in the groin, particularly found in elderly women. And uh, perineal hernias. There are also hernias that arise where there's a diffuse weakness in the abdominal wall an attenuation of the abdominal wall or denervation of the abdominal wall. Examples of these would be a divarication of erecti and some incisional hernias. And I've seen a few apparent hernias arose as a result of a disc protrusion causing a nerve root compression. And these produced uh, swelling that were in the distribution of a dermatome. I don't believe that these sorts of hernias, where there isn't a defect, are really suitable for repair. In the past, I've attempted to repair some divarications, and I've operated on some patients with denervation. The surgery required is extensive, and the results of surgery have been singularly disappointing. How do we manage hernias? Well, hernias that are small, or asymptomatic, often don't require repair. We also aren't terribly keen to repair hernias in the very elderly or people that have serious comorbidities which would make the operation more risky. Generally, hernias are repaired if they are symptomatic or if they are large. And there are certain types of hernias we're more keen to repair than others, in particular femoral hernias. What is the rationale for repairing a hernia? Well, the natural history of a hernia is such that because as a whole, the defect can never heal or close spontaneously. And because of the laws of physics, namely Laplace's law, there's a tendency for hernias to slowly grow larger. Obviously, the smaller the hernia is, the easier it is to repair, and the less likely it is to recur after repair. We repair hernias to relieve symptoms and we repair hernias to prevent complications such as strangulation. Having said that, the actual risk of hernia strangulating is generally low. It's said that the risk of a, an inguinal hernia strangulating is less than 1% per annum. Having said that, I know a surgeon who didn't do anything about his inguinal hernia until it's strangulated, 
and then had to very sheepishly ask one of his colleagues to repair it for him. After hernias are repaired, there's also a risk of them recurring. No one has found a foolproof way of repairing any type of hernia. The risk factors are Firstly, the smaller the hernia it is, the less likely it is to recur. It's more likely to recur in the obese. It's much more likely to recur if there's been a previous repair. The hernias with the highest risk of recurrence are the incisional hernia. It's more likely to recur in people that do heavy lifting and people with a chronic constipation or prostate. Hernias are also much more likely to recur in smokers, in diabetics and in patients that get wound infections after their surgery. Repairing a hernia often involves using a piece of non-absorbable mesh. There are many types of different meshes. Generally, they are classified according to what type of mesh it is. The commonest types of mesh are polypropylene, polyester and polytetrafluoroethylene or expanded polytetrafluoroethylene, which is commonly known as Gore-Tex. Meshes can also be categorised according to their density and they are commonly called lightweight, medium weight or heavy weight. Or, according to pore size, and we talk about meshes being micro or macro porous, or as to whether they can stretch or not in one or more directions. Some meshes are lined or composite, namely made out of more than one material and some of them have special properties. There are also biologic meshes of various types and also synthetic bioabsorbable meshes. Meshes are generally secured either at open operation with sutures or laparoscopically with tacks or staples. In the old days, staples were mainly used but there's a risk of entrapping nerves as the staple is closed. These days we generally use spiral tacks and there's a new product on the market called Secure Strap that looks like a staple but is in fact more akin to paired harpoons. I generally tend to use non-absorbable tacks which are like small metal segments of spring for repairing ventral or incisional hernias and use absorbable tacks which look like small self-tapping screws and here are what they look like. In doing an inguinal hernia I'll also use glue along the bottom edge of the mesh as we cannot insert tacks there and there are a number of types of glue which can be used. I generally use glue brand which is similar to super glue or tissue glue which is derived from human blood products. The mesh becomes incorporated as the tissue grows through the interstices of the mesh. Once that happens, most people aren't aware of their mesh, although in thin people, particularly with heavyweight mesh, sometimes the mesh is palpable. But until the mesh becomes incorporated, certain movements will cause the mesh to move a tiny bit against the tissues pulling on the tacks and giving you a twinge of pain. This is nothing unusual and uh, should settle within three to four months. Some people having hernia repair will end up with some chronic discomfort. This tends to be, uh, I think, underestimated in the surgical literature and as many as 10% 
people who've had a hernia repair by any type will say they get occasional discomfort in the region of the repair. Certainly I get an occasional twinge of pain at my umbilicus where I've had an umbilical hernia repair. A small number of people will get chronic intractable pain that will, will require further treatment. Sometimes this can be a real problem 